thank you all so much for being here on a Friday afternoon, especially after, after all this rain. Um, I would like to start by thanking Professor um, Haken for the invitation, thank Isabel for organizing, making it possible. And also I wanted to say that I've been in Santa Cruz for almost three years now. And uh, before that I was on the East Coast for way too long, way too much, too much snow. <laughs> so I'll take this rain, no problem. Um, so I want to say, you know, thanks for being here because I, I really look forward to establishing connections, you know, since I've only been here for such a short period of time. And I would love to just begin um, thinking together with you all. Um, what I'm going to be presenting today is, in fact, um, a chapter of my book, Mapping Diaspora, African American Roots Tourism in Brazil, that just came out in um, December 2018. Um, I'm going to pass it around. I only have this copy right now. Uh, but um, what I would like to do is really two things. One is I'm going to do a kind of overview of the book, talk about the main issues, um, some of the methods that I used, um, and some of what I identified as like the, the dominant tropes that organize the experience of African Americans in Brazil. Um, but then I want to really zoom into one of the specific chapters, which is chapter four, which is the chapter where I look more in depth at the issue of women traveling, because the majority of the roots tourists, not just in Brazil, uh, and actually not just African Americans, but the majority of diaspora tourists, roots tourists of all different ethnicities tend to be women. And I think there's a, a you know, we really lack research on this. Um, and it's re really interesting because a lot of the books that I, and, and texts that I've come across on African Americans in Africa doing roots tourism on the African continent, they mention that there were many women, or a lot of the interviews are quotes from women. But no, nobody has actually analyzed why is it that women make up this majority, which is one of the issues that I try to explain uh, in the book itself, in the chapter, which is what I'm going to also focus on a little bit here. So to start, I just wanted to explain a little bit who are these tourists that I worked with and that I did my research about. Of course, African Americans from all walks of life travel to Brazil from different uh, age groups, different parts of the United States. You have the group of um, Yoruba religious practitioners, you have, which are usually a little bit older. You have young um, capoeira practitioners who go to capoeira retreats, who actually are not, of course, only African American. Um, so you have different groups that travel to Brazil. The group that I was really focusing on, um, I, I can really um, identify some characteristics. Uh, these are groups that travel, number one, in groups, they are not individuals. Oh, another actually um, interesting um, kind of type of tourist, if you will, uh, that also travel to Brazil are African American sex tourists. Both male sex tourists that travel to Rio predominantly, but um, um, male straight uh, sex tourists, but also there are many um, gay, uh, African American gay tourists, gay sex tourists that travel in fact mostly to Bahia, and there is some research on that. Actually, there's a really interesting book. Um, the title escaped me right now, but it's by anthropologist Greg Mitchell, and he analyzes uh, um, U.S. American sex tour, gay sex tourism in Brazil, but there is a, a chapter in which he discusses specifically African Americans. So I just want to be clear that this is a very specific kind of subset that I'm looking at, right? I don't mean to generalize that all African Americans who travel to Brazil fit into these characteristics. But the, the individuals that I um, interacted with over um, almost a decade and a half, in fact, even though it was a very kind of intermittent uh, um, ethnography, um, in general, they are searching for cultural roots. Uh, heritage is really the, the main issue that they want to engage with. Uh, they travel in organized tour groups. They are very well traveled. Usually when they travel to Brazil, they have traveled to many other Africa, especially African countries, but also European countries, Car the Caribbean as well. Um, and in fact, one of the concepts that I developed in the book is the map of Africanness, because I really try to analyze how Brazil makes sense vis-a-vis -vis the meanings attributed to other countries visited by these tourists. And there is a very specific meaning, which I'll get to talk about in a little bit. Of course, it's not just one, but there are dominant meanings, I would say. They're usually older, to some extent, I would say, uh, retired for the most part. Um, to some extent, I would say that they 
um, are post-civil rights um, uh, generation. Uh, so they really travel with a kind of cognitive map of the meanings of Africa and this kind of desire to, to encounter African roots and of course the awareness that African roots, African culture is dispersed across the diaspora. Uh, mostly women, mostly middle class, college educated, and from many parts of the United States, but predominantly urban centers, major US cities. Um, as far as my methods, uh, mostly ethnographic, um, I did a little bit of archival research, not a whole amount, but I did come across some really interesting documents, um, especially pertaining to the origins of roots tourism in Brazil, which I identified as beginning in 1978 when a really important festival occurred organized by an African-American entrepreneur and an Afro-Bahian um, tourism employee. He was a, an employee of Bahia Plus, so the tourism board. So together they um, organized this event and this event has continues to have um, a kind of domino effect on how this tourism developed. The documentation I came across is really fascinating because it shows how, this is of course during the dictatorship, 1978, the Brazilian um, federal government did not want these black tourists talking about diaspora, talking about black organization, etc. So the Itamaraty documents are really fascinating to look at. How on one hand you have the tourism boards wanting the tourists, uh, wanting the travelers to come and really transform them into tourists, and on the other hand, uh, the Brazilian uh, government not really wanting them there. Um, and then I would say the bulk of the research really was the ethnography, but that always vis-a-vis um, -vis the analysis of visual and textual sources. So the cover of the book, which I'll be happy to talk about if you're curious about where I got that from, I did not put it together, it's an actual um, ad, a uh, promotional ad, but I think it fits so well what the book really looks at. Um, and so I, one of the issues that was very central to the, the research is, and, and which is why I use the term tropes, is because um, a lot of what I heard in my interviews, I also saw in the visual and, and textual sources. Whether we're talking about um, books, feature films, magazines, documentaries, another major source of information are the orientation sessions that because they are traveling as a group, they usually have an orientation session before they travel. And of course, they learn the basic, you know, how to get around, what kinds of clothes to take, what kind of weather you're going to find, the currency, all of that, you know, the pragmatic basic stuff of traveling to a different country. But a lot of it, as one of my main interlocutors in the research, who is a tourism agent herself, she said it's also to get them excited about the destination. It's always to create, it's, it's, all, it's also to create a specific idea of what Bahia is. And, and this is very much about Bahia, even though the book says Brazil, but it's really about Bahia, which I also discuss why. And then word of mouth continues to be predominant in that. So as I was analyzing these different sources and listening to the interviews, of course there was a reiteration of ideas. And these ideas, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which are the tropes I was referring to, um, they tie into the central issues that I discussed in the book. So as I started to do the research, I, I began to realize that these three central issues are very much um, engaged. One is how do national and racial identities come together when they are interpolated at the same time? After all, African Americans are interacting with Afro-Brazilians as co-participants in the black diaspora. But then, at the same time, they are members of the superpower. They are citizens of the, of the United States. So how do these encounters um, allow for the enactment of national subjectivities, national identity, especially when that national identity is a, an identity attached to a superpower. Um, but then at the same time, um, the issue of solidarity was really crucial and it came across in very important ways. And I think it's important to emphasize this because Usually when we talk about tourism, it's easy to ridicule tourists, right? It's easy to say, oh, tourists are silly, they are gullible, you can just sell whatever they want to them, etc. And I really wanted to stay away from that. And I'm happy that today we have a very solid scholarship, uh, anthropological, sociological, and cultural studies based uh, re, uh, scholarship on tourism, 
which I think offers a more nuanced uh, analysis. So um, solidarity is a crucial aspect of this kind of tourism. And in fact, I have an entire chapter which just looks at what I call solidarity projects and solidarity practices. The practices which are ongoing, such as, just to give you a hint and get you curious about the book, <laughs> um, uh, these groups say, we actually want black guys and demanding black guys. And that creates a whole ripple effect. So even though we're talking about Bahia, so supposedly you would have black guides. Well, you do, but they're not the majority. And then you have to start training black guides because there is a demand for black guys. So that in itself is very powerful and very transformative. Uh, or they would also say, you know, we want to buy um, handcraft or precious stones, or whatever it is, we want to buy it from black people. We want to do business with Afro-Brazilians. So channeling their dollars for that. So that has also been, I think, very important in this kind of, re of, of tourism. And then, um, of course, tied into all of that is the geopolitics of the black diaspora. So even though um, this kind of tourism allows for a little bit of a decentering of the United States, so there is, it presents a little bit of a challenge to the dominant US-centric uh, notions of blackness that continue to be dominant, I would say, it does offer for a little bit of a challenge because after all, it is about people traveling in search of other references of blackness. However, at the same time, other asymmetries continue to exist, such as, number one, most obviously, those who have access to travel versus those who don't, right? So it's a bit like Kincaid's, Jamaica Kincaid's point about every tourism is a native, but not every native has the chance to become a tourist, right? Um, so it is about that. That's one of the asymmetries. Another major asymmetry is this, and this I'm already kind of beginning to discuss the tropes a little bit, is the idea that we are traveling because we want to exchange with other black communities, but this exchange of experiences, of histories, is usually based on the idea that we are going to bring modernity and we are going to exchange that for tradition. Um, and then another major asymmetry is about who, ha who has the greater access to the means of representation. So when we were talking about those sources, if we think of documentaries, books, um, uh, whether it's feature films or, you know, you name it, who usually, if, we, if we're looking at the black diaspora, of course African Americans have more access to the means through which they can represent themselves, other countries in the African diaspora, other communities in the African diaspora. So those asymmetries continue to permeate um, this kind of, of experience. In terms of the tropes themselves, and then I'll, I'll just explain that a little bit, show you some um, examples, and then I'll get into chapter four. So there are three major tropes. One thing I want to mention from the very beginning is that these three tropes um, are not just kind of stemming from the African-American roots tourist gaze. And I actually, for those of you who are familiar with the scholarship on tourism, John Ory was definitely a big influence for me. I have a whole chapter on the tourist gaze itself. Um, but what is, I think, is important to think of these tropes is that they are formed as the result of a paradoxical convergence between, on the one hand, a race-conscious African-American roots tourist gaze, and on the other hand, the narrative of racial harmony divulged by a tourism industry that sees itself and wants to continue to promote um, a, a, an idea of racial democracy. So it's <coughs> paradoxical in the sense that it's, it's really the encounter of two different perspectives, but which end up creating um, these different these three tropes. The first two, I, I would say, are much really the result of these two perspectives. The third one, I think, is more a US um, perspective dominant, on which I'll talk about. The first is really this idea of Bahia as a close Africa. And um, this is actually the cover of the, this specific edition of American Legacy, um, the magazine of African American history and culture, uh, and the article that describes Bahia um, that is in this issue was photocopied and circulated by many of these groups and, the, and in, during these orientation sessions that I was talking about before. So they, they would read this, they would get more information about Bahia as a city of post Africa. This expression itself, as far as I could trace it, was um, coined by the African-American entrepreneur who 
was one of the um, organizers of the 1978 event. And the idea that what is important to think about by years of closer Africa is that it's not just physically closer and easier to get to, it's also emotionally cozier because the history of slavery has been significantly downplayed. And this is where, again, we see this paradoxical convergence of, you know, and of course, this, the state of Bahia and, and Brazil itself as, you know, a, 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 a nation has downplayed the history of, <clears throat> of slavery. Otherwise, you know, there's no racial democracy, whether as myth, ideology, um, fast, whatever you want to call it, to grounded upon if you don't don't play slavery. Um, so it's it's really these two things, the physical closeness but also the um, uh, emotional comfort felt. And of course again thinking of Brazil vis-a-vis -vis other uh, countries visited in the search for roots. So the pain that is encountered in West Africa could very well be found in Bahia as long as you look for it and as long as it is presented to you. But it's, it's a bit like the hour say, junta fome com a vontade de comer. I don't know how many of you speak Portuguese, but it's like, you know, two kind of perspectives coming together. Even though they are paradoxical, they end up converging. Um, the second trope, which um, is very much sold, I would say, by the tourism industry of Brazil, but which was also, I could also find in many of the um, interviews and in many of the sources I examined, is the kind of old anthropological trope of the happy native, which we find in favela tours, the idea that, oh, they are poor, but they are happy, they live together, they, you know, there's a lot of kind of cultural fulfillment. So the idea that Afro-Brazilians are materially poor, materially deprivated, but culturally very rich, so culturally very fulfilled, living authentic lives. That was an idea that came across very much. I mean, just the, and this is the article that is in the magazine that I was talking about. So where Africa also lives, and when you look at the image, you see the favela, you see poverty, the houses are pretty run down, but then you see people happy and dancing and fulfilled. So it's this constant idea that you see in the visual sources, and then in some snippets of the interviews. And I'll let you read it so that I can sips and butter. <laughs> issues that I then develop in the book is the fact that um, even though on the surface um, roots tourism and ethnic tourism are very different because the so and, and the way I, I analyze it is that roots tourism is very much a search for sameness, a search for similarity, the idea that you will encounter your diaspora brothers and sisters or your diaspora counterparts, so some of them use uh, that as an expression. And then, as we know, ethnic tourism is very much a search for otherness, right? So, and the more extreme the otherness, the better for the ethnic tourists. So even though these are very different kinds of tourism, at the end of the day, some kind of similarity also exists because there is also the idea that the extreme other that one finds in ethnic tourism is also fulfilled because they are closer to nature than we modern people have become. And in this case, it's also the idea that they are materially deprived, but they are um, kind of closer to culture. So it's not about nature, but it's co closer to culture, to the original African culture that was um, supposedly preserved uh, in Brazil more than in the United States. Um, at least, of course, as the discourse goes, right? Um, the third trope, which is, you know, again, they are very intersected, is what I call the trope of black evolutionism. And this is, and this, again, um, and I have some snippets of the interviews to show how the, in, the discourse that came across in the interviews is very much similar to the discourse that I found in the visual sources. So in this um, Essence article describing Brazil, I mean, the, the title itself, it's, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, right? Brazil, the way we were. So it's this idea that Afro-Brazilians are today what we were at one point in the past. 
And I want to call your attention to this um, last part here where it says, um, physically the work in Brazil as a slave was a backbreaker, but culturally the South American system of slavery cut our ancestors some slack. Most of them came from the same strip of African coastline and tribal, tribal units generally were broken, weren't broken up. So language, dress, cookery, music, and religion often remained intact. On festival days, our folks, meaning Afro-Brazilians, um, donned African costume, sang the old songs, and danced to the drums as if they were funking it up back in the motherland. So you see these, um, you know, uh, this notion in the visual sources, and then I have some, and, and I have so many examples in the book of this evolutionist idea that they are today what we were in the past. As you see here, I had thought previously that I would find not only a large black population, but I, th I thought there would be a greater advancement on the part of the Africans in this country. As I learned about it, it was not so much disappointment, but I have to recognize that that will happen. But the stages of this development are less advanced than I had thought. So stages, development, um, they lag behind, um, they, they are still going to catch up on us, etc. It was a constant in, were expressions that were constant in the interviews as well as the visual sources. And in this case here, when I first started going to Salvador in the mid-80s, what I saw was the United States civil rights struggle 50 years ago. In other words, Salvador was 50 years behind what we were doing here. Um, when I, I, uh, this, I did this interview, uh, Spike Lee had visited Brazil recently. He had been there when the Supreme Court voted on the constitutionality of racial quotas in higher education and unanimously approved racial quotas in higher education, which was a huge deal, right? So when that was happening, people were celebrating, right? At least people in the left were celebrating that that was happening. And then Spike Lee was interviewed and he said, this is great that this is happening, but it also shows that it's late. After all, um, we abolished slavery uh, 20 years before you guys did here. So you're about 20 years behind us. So this idea of Afro-Brazilians as being behind was definitely a constant. Um, so what I want to do next is talk a little bit about um, the cha chapter four, uh, which I call We Bring Home the Roots, African-American uh, Women um, Treading the Diaspora and uh, Bearing the Nation. Um, and I, of course, I have to do it kind of quickly because of the time we have, but I, I organize the chapter around these three items here, the importance of embodiment and what it means for, for traveling. Of course, there's a lot of focus on the tourist gaze, but we don't just travel with our eyes, obviously, right? We travel with our whole body. So what does it mean to travel as a woman vis-a-vis -a, -vis a man? What does it mean to travel as a black woman, right? So that in itself brings uh, specific hindrances, obstacles to be dealt with. And then the fact that women usually de describe their experience and even the reason that brought them to Brazil as connected to the need to heal, heal themselves and heal their community. I did not come across any man who said that, but most of the women did. Um, and then I want to end by talking a little bit about um, how then race and gender are mapped onto space, place and time. And I plan to do that in 20 minutes, so. <laughs> so I'm going to read to not lose too much track of time. So as we know, travel in general has been empowering for women um, since it has allowed them to exert autonomy and challenge traditional gender roles. And most of the research on women travel, travelers uh, or even women tour, uh, tourists have focused on white women, even when they are you know, traveling because, uh, as tourists, as sex tourists, and how that challenges traditional sexual norms, etc. So there's not really a lot of research on black women traveling. So I really wanted to uh, kind of fill a little bit that void at least. Um, at the same time that travel is empowering for women, we know that it's also, it continues to be, even in this day and age, very risky, right? So the fear of harassment, the fear of rape, um, even though they are permanent threats for women at home, they are uh, usually intensified when women travel abroad and are exposed to the unknown. Women's greater need to protect their physical and psychological integrity is therefore one of the main reasons why traveling solo is not such an option as it is for men, and therefore traveling in these groups, uh, 
gives them some kind of protection. Um, and I have a whole discussion of what that means for diaspora tourists whose purpose is to engage with those people that they find in their destination. So how much does the bubble of the tourism tour group um, becomes an, ob so an obstacle, becomes a hindrance. And I here wanted to refer very briefly to uh, June Jordan's report from the Bahamas. Those of you who haven't read it, read it. It's amazing. It's a short text that she wrote about what it meant for her to be a, a black woman in the Bahamas, but at the same time, middle class from the United States, carrying US dollars, and the irony that the only way she could feel safe especially from the fear of men and what men could do to her body, to her integrity, was through staying in a corporate ho hotel, like a capitalist corporation, ironically, would be the place where she felt safe. So she talks about the, the painful ironies of her multiple identities in this context. Um, and then, of course, racial identity indisputably intersects with gender. And if women overall are less respected than men, black women in particular are not only more so, but in very specific ways. Most of the women I interviewed describe the occurrence of racist interactions during their trips to Brazil. But at the same time, they spoke about how their embodiment was also a source of great pleasure. And they described um, how delighted they were to observe the physical resemblance between themselves and so many Brazilian women. To be among a black majority was a, a very important part of the trip and a very um, overwhelmingly positive experience. So they talked about you know, the similarities of skin color, phenotype, hair texture, of sharing this, uh, the phenotype, but also witnessing how other black women um, have lived in other countries, and a constant also that uh, I heard several times from many of the women I interviewed was the idea that they here you were fighting the same struggle that we were. So the word struggle came across very much. So I would say these two major elements, you know, the similarity of phenotype was really important to be among a black majority, but also to learn how do other black communities live, how do they fight racism and how do they live their daily life. So that was a very, those, I would say those two elements were really crucial in what they, they define as the healing process. And here is a quote uh, that I would like to share. Um, and this was said to me by an African American woman in Cachoeira in the uh, countryside of Bahia in the year 2000. The healing process also brings us here to Brazil and to Africa and to other countries throughout the diaspora so that we can heal not only as individuals but as a people. So the interviews revealed a tendency among the female tourists to think of their journeys to these various points of the map of Africanness as healing opportunities for themselves but also for their communities. In my research, as I said before, I encountered an overwhelmingly greater amount of women than men. Um, and even though there is a predominance of women than men um, among roads tourists, there is a, a very limited amount of research on why women take upon themselves this role. Um, there is certainly a pragmatic, albeit no less gendered explanation for why women make up the majority of roots and heritage tourists. As the one who are usually in charge of reproductive labor, uh, and the maintenance of the well-being of the family, women are predominantly responsible for planning vacations. So in a group of 15 people, usually you would have two men, and the, uh, the other 15 would be women. And usually these men were there because their wives had organized the whole trip and kind of they were tagging along, basically. Um, so analyzing black women's representations of place, quote, in a world that has profited from black displacement, Catherine McKittrick argues that black women's expressive acts spatialize the imperative of a perspective of struggle, end quote. It is the commonality of this shared struggle that brings so many African-American women to different sides of the map of Africanness in search of references that may contribute to increase the knowledge regarding how other black communities live and thrive. The interviews indicate that embracing Africa and the Africanness that exists in the diaspora is fundamentally important in the restoration of a dignified black identity. The centrality of African heritage is a process, in the process of healing is also noticeable in the DNA craze that's happened, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, the majority of black folks, and I don't know how that applies to other communities, but I would 
um, speculate that it's probably the same. The majority are women of the um, genetic, you know, the people that are reconstructing their genetic uh, tree of the family. Whether they are doing it through DNA or through historical documents, most of them are in fact women. And I wanted to here just mention briefly um, uh, Alondra Nelson's book on the, the DNA, in which she analyzes the importance of DNA testing specifically for African American, the African American communities in the United States. And she talks exactly about that. And she makes a really important point about women taking on the role of kin keepers. So this kin keeping that, I, that um, Alondra Nelson identified in her research, which has to do with you know, making sure um, women um, keep in touch with you know, make sure the relatives are always in touch with one another, I think also applies to the ancestors, even if they, if they are not the most direct ancestor, but if, if we think of it in a more broad diaspora term of the, the, dia the broad diaspora family. So I think that in part explains also why women take that role upon themselves. So in order to understand the gendering of tourism, it is crucial to examine how the dominant travel discourses are themselves fundamentally gendered. As Doreen Massey explains, the categories place local and global are never neutral or objective. They are instead invoked and naturalized through gendered, sexualized, and racialized processes. Massey is very critical of the masculinist understanding of time as having agency over space, where space is associated with stasis, simple reproduction, nostalgia, and passivity, while time is associated with activity, change, and transformation. As a result of this binary form of thinking, time has been coded masculine and space feminine. Extending this critique that Massey develops about space to the more specific notion of place, I would argue that the ways in which places have been gendered also reveal a gendering of time. The trope of Bahia as a closer Africa that is so central for the African American roots tourist experience undeniably represents both Bahia and Africa in very feminized terms. Both locations are conceived of as homelands, Mama Africa as the obviously gendered motherland, and Bahia as a more implicitly gendered shortcut to Africa. The characterization of a place as home um, that is, and that, to use Massey's word, an unchanging stability to be, to be looked back upon, to be returned to, is itself masculine, as it relies on the notion of the mother to whom one returns. Yet, the feminization of a place is also intertwined with the feminization of the culture that is primarily associated with such place. The representations of an Africanized Bahia predominantly rely on images of black women as cultural markers, quintessentially exemplified in the Bayana's Jacarajé, which you may or may not be familiar with. And this is a, an image of a Bayana selling Jacarajé in the streets. And this is the stylized uh, Bayana receptive, and the name indicates she's there to receive, welcome the tourist. And there's a whole controversy going on in Brazil. I don't know how much you guys are following about the Bayanas, so we can talk about that later if you, if you want to. <laughs> um, and then, so these women um, are predominantly portrayed as um, the markers of tourism, and in the uh, for Bahia in general, but in the case of roots tourism, the Sisters of the Good Death are the quintessential, um, in fact, attraction for most of the tourists. And I, I'm not discussing this in this talk because that itself <laughs> In fact, there is a book being written just about this, by the way, not by me. <laughs> um, so the, usually they are portrayed as living samples of the preservation, and that was a term I gave across a few times, um, of um, African culture in the diaspora. Um, although research has shown the potentially empowering effects of tourism for impoverished women, and there's a lot of research on this, so Walt Little talks about Maya women in Guatemala and how empowering it has been to, you know, the idea that women are more Indian than Marisol de la Cadena had discussed as a, a problem. In tourism, that has also been used as a resource by impoverished women themselves. So by performing their identities, they have been able to sometimes break free of abusive husbands or break free of just, you know, poverty itself, but then at the same time, um, it also keeps the, uh, preserves this role of women as these quintessential markers of culture. 
In the case of rules tourism and tourism overall, I would say it has benefited the sisters, not financially, that's a whole other issue. Um, but it, it, symbolically, it has been very important for them. But this has relied on a process that positions the sisters, the culture that they guard and preserve, and the place with whom they are conflated as frozen in the past. Furthermore, the deployment of the image of the Sisters of the Good Death to represent an Africanized Bahia, while potentially empowering and certainly dignifying for the sisters, does not prevent the strengthening of the trope of black evolution, where African Americans perceive themselves as more advanced and or more fortunate than other black diaspora communities despite marveling at the Africanness that the Sisters of the Good Death have supposedly been able to maintain, some of the female tourists also commented on how physically deteriorated Afro-Brazilian women of their age, including some of the sisters, appear to be in contrast to themselves. And here I want to um, screen a quote from one of my interviewees, um, who I'm calling Deborah. all of the names are pseudonyms in the book, um, she is a retired probation officer. By the time she visited Brazil in 2004, she had visited Senegal, Ghana, South Africa, Gambia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Zanzibar, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. Although she was enthusiastic about the Africanness that she found in Bahia, and despite praising the fact that the poverty that she, she saw in Brazil was not as abject as the poverty she had, had seen in West Africa, she was surprised at how worn out senior Afro-Brazilian women appeared to be. The women of age here are totally different from American women. I look at your women and I see weariness. I saw a woman the other day that I know was younger than I was, but who seemed a lot older. I mean, look at us. I am a retired person, but I am really in my golden years. I am 67. And most of the women in this group is in their late 60s and early 70s. I saw those ladies and I started praying, saying, God, I am glad that I was raised in America, in North America, because it is a whole different look, a whole different attitude, a whole different purpose. Um, the reason I wanted to screen this quote, of course, there are many quotes in the book, but I think this one in particular is revealing of many of the tropes that I was pointing to before and many of the issues that are addressed in the book. Um, first, it expresses a conflation of the gendering of people, place, and time. Second, it shows female embodiment as a reflection of the geopolitical position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Brazil and West African countries. Th and of course, South Africa mentioned that. Third, it reiterates the notion, which I discussed in my previous chapters, that the enslavement and subsequent relocation, relocation of one's ancestors has led to one's contemporary status as a citizen of the United States, and being a U.S. American, as Deborah unequivocally states, is a blessing for which one should be grateful. This confirms that the trope of the happy native relies on what Dean McCannell calls rhetoric association and antithesis, that is, the enthusiasm for a specific aspect of the culture of the other, you know, the food, the religion, the Africanness that has been maintained, in this case, does not prevent that the other's overall society may be perceived as inferior or at a disadvantage when compared to one's own. Fourth, it shows that while discourses are gendered, both women and men may, rep may reproduce these gendered notions. Women, of course, are not immune from reiterating the masculinist trope of black evolution that projects U.S. Americans as ahead or more fortunate uh, than their diasporic counterparts. The trope of black evolutionism, as in fact any evolutionist reasoning, is inherently masculinist. Because it uses time to classify difference, presupposing that peoples evolve from less to more advanced stages, Evolutionism relies on the naturalization of the masculine action of time over a static and feminine notion of place. The civilizing and or uplifting logic present in Western discourses of evolution, as well as other epistemologies originated in the Enlightenment, are profoundly gendered and grounded on patriarchal presuppositions that have relied on the implicit assumption of the masculine self, usually but not necessarily white, as the neutral standard against which the feminine, the feminized other, used but not necessarily women, should be measured. So, to conclude, um, I couldn't really end this presentation without mentioning the profound political crisis which Brazil has been facing since the parliamentary coup d'etat 
that um, ousted our legitimately elected president, Juma Hussef, in 2016, which, as we know, was entirely also grounded um, and um, permeated by misogyny from beginning to end. Um, when the coup happened, we thought we had, we had hit rock bottom, and of course, mm -hmm. how wrong we were, right? We had no idea that our problems were just beginning. No one could imagine that two years later, Brazil would be electing a neo-fascist and unapologetically racist, sexist, and homophobic president. It seems impossible not to describe Brazil's current political situation as a regression. The overpowering sense that we are walking backward, that we are receding toward a previous and less advanced stage of the country's development has informed the leftist analysis of the recent turn of events. Appalled by my country's situation, I too have caught myself employing the same evolutionist language that I have been so critical about in my own research. The shock and outrage, however, should not make us lose sight of the fact that evolutionist understandings are unproductive, even when they seem appealing. Because um, it relies on a linear understanding of history, evolutionism prioritizes some actors, elements, and processes over others, instead of providing more holistic and inclusive frameworks. frameworks yes. History is better understood, I think, as a series of nodes, where multiple processes take place simultaneously and above all, where multiple and oftentimes opposing actors dispute the very meaning of progress as well as to whom its gains should be extended. In July 2016, as Brazil was getting ready to host the Olympic Games, a delegation of Black Lives Matter activists traveled to Rio de Janeiro to meet with Brazilian activists who were equally fighting police violence against primarily Afro-Brazilians. Similar to previous black transnational movements, the members of this coalition are aware that racism must be fought both locally and globally, and that notwithstanding local specificities, they can all learn from shared struggles and forms of resistance. Furthermore, these activists are equally aware that the power attached to their national identities also affects the visibility of their struggles. This was candidly expressed in the words of Donasia Yancey, the director of the Boston chapter of the Black Lives Matter who spearheaded the visit to Brazil. She said, quote, we have been invited here by local activists and we're here to lend our solidarity and, these are her words, our Americanness, to use our United States privilege to bring media attention to these issues. And this was a current, you know, the idea that we know we carry this badge of US identity. It's not just the US dollars, but the Americanness that we carry. So we want to lend that in support of Afro-Brazilians, and that in itself has been very empowering. So to end on a positive note, perhaps this younger generation of African Brazilians and Afro, Afro, Afro sorry, African Americans and Afro-Brazilians that have been mobilizing across national boundaries to fight the globalization of police brutality will gradually pave the way for a new trend of diaspora travel where searching for roots may be less vital than asserting, even now, the humanity of black lives. Some might argue that this is yet another sign of what? Regression, right? Since this should no longer be necessary, especially after the post-civil rights, the, the, after the civil rights movement. Um, I prefer to see it instead of, you know, a regression, I prefer to see it as a shift of focus, a focus on a different set of actors who are not only members of a younger generation, but also whose racial identity intersects with their membership to the working class. As such, they are trailing different journeys, following different directions, and are possibly guided by an altogether different compass. Thank you. <laughs>